Yeah, so the idea, of course, is to try, and the idea is to try to determine whether we have between conflict and confluence, that's conflict, or confluence between uh, Torah and Teva, Teva being the Hebrew word for nature. nature. And there's, there's the way the world seems to be put together in natural terms seem to match the way the world is put together in divine terms in the, in the, in the Torah without bending either of the pieces of sources of wisdom, naming Torah and, and science. And in all the work, in all the books, in all the talks, and all the things I do, I only use ancient biblical commentary. No modern biblical commentary. Because all modern commentators have heard of Hubble, heard of dinosaurs, bend the Bible to match the science. Bend the science to match the Bible. But the but the, uh, when you take the ancient commentators, you don't have the problem of having a, of a person trying to make the words fit the science or make the science fit the text. An example, by the way, of let's see, a very high, high, highly ranked professor showing that the Bible had to be wrong. And it's an interesting example. It doesn't have to do with the age of the universe. It has to do with, with evolution and paleontology. And it was a mistake made by a person who was listed as one of the 20 most important writers of the 20th century. My background's MIT. He was up the river at Harvard. J Stephen Jay Gould, he died of cancer a few years ago. Gould was one of the most important writers in the United States, listed by Time Magazine. He's one of, the, one of the 20 most important writers of the previous century. And Gould was able to prove with no equivocation that the Bible was wrong. He loved the Bible as literature. He loved Gilbert and Sullivan and also as literature and music. He thought the Bible was great, great, great literature, but it was totally a myth. He was a Jew, needless to say. That's, he, that's the kind of person that feels that way, actually. And he was proud to say that he was from the clan of the Levites, that his, had his family served in the temple. So when a person like that tells you the Bible is wrong and proves it from within his field, that's important. Let's bring this out so sometimes you're going to get a person giving you an example of how he can show the Bible is wrong. And very often the problem is, as was with Gould, who was a brilliant human, human being and a wonderful person, you know, bleeding heart for the, the suffering of the world, but he didn't know Hebrew. He didn't know, and I spent a few, I only had a few conversations with him, he didn't know Hebrew, and yet he was willing to tell the world that the Bible had made a blooper and that mistake couldn't have been made if, in fact, the Bible was divine. And the mistake was in his field of paleontology. And he pointed out that on day five, when animals are mentioned of, of the six days of Genesis we're talking about, on day five, Genesis chapter one, about verse, about verse 20 or 21, 20 and 21, where it says that, that the waters teem with teams of living creatures, which is interesting, because this fossil record says that also, it's called the Cambrian explosion of life. But then it says in the English, and that and fowls flew above and fowl flew above the earth, or the Jerusalem translate the Jerusalem Bible, that's that's the that's the stone edition, the the, the the old one, the Jerusalem calls it, and birds flying above the earth. And Gould wrote this up in several articles that that appeared in public literature. Otherwise I wouldn't have seen it because I didn't follow his writing that closely. And he pointed out that birds or fowl don't appear with the animal in the fossil record. Animals like birds or fowl do not appear with the types of animals that are listed on day number five. They appear with the animals that are listed on day number six. So how could God have made such a mess up as to put birds on day five when any paleontologist knows they appear with these higher animals, you know, they, they evolve from uh, from reptiles, but so you have to be into day number six. And that was his, those were his data. What, what astounds me is a person as brilliant as Gould would be willing to criticize a text which he couldn't read in the original. Because when you read it in the original, the text says neither bird nor fowl. It says oaf. oaf. Now today in modern Hebrew, oaf means chicken, but not in biblical Hebrew. What, is, what does oaf mean in biblical Hebrew? An animal with wings, a winged animal. We see that in, in Baikra in Leviticus, shed its oaf. In other words, oaf is any animal that flies. So what would be the first of the types of animals that would fly? Any guesses? No, no, no. Think, 
think, think through before you link. It says like those words they think before you click. Bugs. <coughs> what, what? Bugs. Bugs, yeah. The simplest of animals. Insects. Insects. And insects map exactly onto day five. But if a human were writing the book for flight, they would have said exactly what the guys in the back were saying. You know, they six type animals, birds and that kind of stuff. But insects are the ones, insects invented flight, if you want to use that word. And we see until today, the most primitive <coughs> flying animals are small, I, I've watched them actually with goggles under the water. You go to any body of water that's slightly polluted, like a fish pond or something, because food's always going into it. And little animals, little worm-like animals called chironomids, like a millimeter or so in diameter, about four or five millimeters long. You want to see a, <coughs> a piece of brilliance in nature. They live on the bottom, eating up the, the gook that, you know, that tries to fall down. Occasionally fish get to eat them also. But otherwise, the ones that survive, then they mature. And in the evening, and only in the evening, they have no appendages, just a mouth and anus and their tube. But they learn to swim like the dolphins can do that kind of body motion. I could never do it. My daughters can do it. You know, just you do it like that without, yeah. without your hands. You can actually swim that way. I don't know how you manage what name it. And they get to the surface only in the evening. And although they're heavier than water, because of the surface tension, they don't sink. And they stay on the top. And then they unzip to form a canoe. Only unzip on the top, never on the bottom. They unzip to form a canoe. And out comes the Chironomid fly. It's thought the stone flies are the first of the same, same general family. Nature invented flight, if you want to keep using those words, on day five. And had Stephen Jay Gould, who bless your memory, my, my guess is he knows the mistake. Now, Steve, I'm still using an example, but I gotta point out, you don't know Hebrew, don't criticize the text. You know. Uh, so anyway, it's just it's just an example. But Rabbi Beta was saying also, so, you know, that sometimes you're going to hear some high-powered professor, and Gould, Gould was a phenomenally pop popular professor, a magnificent writer, <coughs> telling you the Bible is wrong, you're going to believe it, you know, and he's going to say, and I'm recalling besides, or lady besides. I mean, for sure he's got the credentials. Except he didn't have the most important credential. He didn't know how to read the text. Anyway, totally relevant, except for the fact that be careful when you throw things at things, you know, like the professor will say, there are no absolutes, and that's absolutely true. Yeah, so be careful. <coughs> okay, the, uh, I guess, <coughs> I want to talk about, I limit myself to about five or six, ten, five or ten minutes to evolution and then the ancient universe. Not the statistics of what could happen or what couldn't happen, but the definition of evolution, how it works, and then how it's reported and how it works. If there were a smaller group who had more time, I'd ask someone if someone's taken eight. How many of you would anyone here have taken AP in bio, biological sciences? Yeah. Someone want it? This is the time of worry. But get, get, okay, quickly, just very quickly, out loud, tell me the two stages of evolution. The stage evolution is, two, is a two-stage process. To make it easy, the second stage is strong lions eat weak lions. The first stage, and how do you get some lions to be strong and some weak? That's the question. How does the first stage work? You take, what, what do you hear? Heard, heard, what? Random mutations I'm hearing? There are no data that show the mutations are random. That the mutations happen for sure when 99 or 98 percent chimpanzee. So that's not a problem. Mutations are not a problem for the Torah. The Torah is well aware of There's a whole section in Vayikra, Leviticus, where mutations cause imperfections in the body and make it impossible for certain people to serve in the temple. So, so genetic mutations are not a problem for the Torah. That life developed from the symbol of the complex had better be true or the fossil record is wrong and the Torah is wrong. Because as far as animal life goes, the Torah describes the development of animal life in six sentences starting in Genesis chapter 1 verse 20. And by verse 26 you already have, you have Adam and one of those sentences is just there's evening and morning of fifth day. Life starts in the waters, moves to the land, becomes mammal, becomes Adam, becomes human. That's all the text says, which is what the fossil record says also in exactly that order, except that it's hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of samples in between. <coughs> so the development of life is not a problem. The question is what drove the development. And when I heard in the back there, someone said random mutations in, in the sex line, obviously. The mutations are not the problem. The word random is the problem. 
There are no data that show that the mutations are random. There are no data that prove that God made the mutations either. It's, it's probably a mix of God stepping in and pulling out, because I have to see soon. But when you're taught in, in university, <coughs> or in high school, or any of that, or you read a book, and you discover that you're told that the mutations were random, it is an assumption that is completely unfounded. The mutations happened, that's for sure. The question is what drove the mutations, and eventually, in one of the groups, I give us, <laughs> I've said this so many times, every time I give us a little blurb before I get to the age of the universe, I say the same thing. Eventually there's going to be a guy or a gal in the, in the in listening group that is either a lawyer or has a, or has a relative that's a lawyer, a smart one, not a dummy like the ones they handled the one in Pennsylvania. The, a decade and a half ago. A smart lawyer will take her to the courts in the United States of America. It will be forbidden to teach that nature of, ev of, of evolution in publicly funded schools and science classes. In a private school, you teach what you want. But in science classes, in a school that gets publicly funding, it is forbidden to teach theology. And the statement that random mutations make the changes is a theological statement. It says God is not present. Randomness says God is not present. There are no data that support the data are random. There are no data support that God did it either. I think actually if you look at the statistics, it looks more like teleology than randomness. But the data, but the definition at time, we've had so many professional biologists at, at Ashra's teaching, you know, they come from time to time, people have spent decades of their life, and they always come up with a definition. Random mutations in the sex line make some baby lines stronger, some weaker, etc. And strong lines eat weak lines. That's not random. Cheat the fast cheating, get more food, and slow cheating. The question is, what's the, what are the mutations that make the cheater fast, some cheater faster than others? Were they random or not? That's the question, yes. What would be an example of data that would show this random? Is there such a thing? I have. I, could there be I, I, I don't think there would be, no, because the fact that there's a whole variety of life that occurs and then some get eaten and some don't get eaten doesn't prove randomness or not. That's just the way nature works. But the fact, but by saying that it's random, you've then said the data show that they're random. I'm not saying they're not random, I'm saying we don't know. So the proper word would either be that life developed. Developed is neutral. Or it doesn't say yes God or no God. The life developed from the simpler complex is exactly what Genesis chapter 1 says, and is what, what every biology course teaches also. The question is what drove it. And, that's, and the problem is then, when it's taught that it's random, that's a theological approach to the, to the uh, a negative theology, but negative theology is as powerful as, as positive theology. The simple fact is that the textbook should have to make it clear that we don't know if it's random. And I'll give you one example, and then I'll get to the top of the evening, because it and they have a bunch of them here, but just one, that's an example. <coughs> the humanity switch. Okay, you can't see this, but you see it, like, I'm sure you can't read the word, obviously. But it, it goes from a uh, chip-type skull, change, 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 to a human skull. So there are transitional forms, not complete ones, but here's a batch from chips. Chips are our common ancestor, the ancestor. They break off from us about five, uh, <coughs> about five million years ago. Chips and to humans, the humanity switch. And these are the data that they're pl plotted here. And this is, this is, I just do very quickly, because the, the data, the data that, that are plotted, this is not plotted, I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. Increasing complexity here, people. Back here, there's a gene. The gene already <coughs> exists. Bingo, about five million years ago. Common ancestor breaks off. <coughs> one goes this way, one goes this way. This becomes chimps. This gene that already existed, already existed, it was waiting in the wings, doubles itself. Come, another common ancestor goes off this way, Austra, Austra, to the or something. Where is it? Yes, yeah, that's right. Then it duplicates itself again and you get people. Those are the data that are presented in this article, in great deal discussing the, the also, the, the, this is not a peer, this is the new scientist, it's not peer review, but it's only peer review data. <coughs> And, those, uh, and that is the discussion of how the, these, among a few others, but these are the major mutations that occur, change the skull shape from a chip skull to a human skull, and the shape of the brain is very strongly mapped by the, sh by the shape of the skull itself. So those are the data. Let's just throw off. Here is the summary in the New Scientist. 
this executive was talking about a moment ago about randomness. The essence of humanity largely boils down to a bunch of random mutations, every one of them happening by chance. The essence of humanity largely boils down to a bunch of random mutations, every one of them happening by chance. Really? Is that what the article said? No, they don't say that. What the article said was the following. The essence of humanity largely boils down to a bunch of mutations. That's what the article said. That's what's written in the text. But see, that's not adequate for you dummies that you have to read this stuff. You've got to be told that it's chance and randomness. And that's a real problem, because that's the goal in much of literature. I can take stuff in the New York Times also, which I have here. We're not going to spend time on that. But keep in mind, when you're told that it's random and there's no evidence of a teleology, <coughs> that may be a totally, uh, how should I say, a totally prejudicial understanding of the data, which are not there at all. So anyway. Any, any suggest thoughts on that one? I'm wiping off the board or any questions? If you are. Oh, oh, oh. You don't want to knock the board down? about zero. What? No, the beginning of life no one has a clue about. Even the famous ones like Richard Dawkins in his famous book The God Delusions, etc. You can read it or hear it on, hear it on books on tape. He devotes one sentence to the origin of life. A stroke of luck. And no, no one, there's origin of life no one has a clue about. In fact, who was it? Was it, was it Franklin that said? I think it was that said that anyone who tells you that he, uh, he or she understands the origin of life is either a knave or a liar. Okay. We have no that the universe is made to sustain life. That's for certain. It is perfect for sustaining life. But sustaining life is a completely different book than starting life. There's not a clue. The first forms of life had to know about reproduction. Realize that the first form of life had to be able to reproduce with change. Because if the first forms of life didn't know how to reproduce and reproduce with change, then we wouldn't be sitting here today. So that so the you know the life may have tried to start many times, that's that could be, but the idea that rocks and water, it's worse than it's more complex than even rocks and water. It's energy that becomes alive eventually. The Big Bang you didn't produce rocks and water, it produced energy. Yeah. But I want his ancient years, but go ahead. Say you go back four billion years, but then we say the little earth is only like five thousand seven hundred. Yeah, okay, so that's the ancient universe. Yeah, that's okay, we'll get to thank you. Yeah, okay, one more question. You're saying that mutations um, basically are random, right? No, I did not say that. 
I've seen the following. We don't know if you, that the mutations happened, I think, absolutely certain. We don't know if they're random or not random. Hence, to say that they are random is a prejudicial statement. We could just say the mutations happen. But a huge majority of them don't have any purpose. The organism dies, the cell kills it, destroys the cell, the apoptosis, and it's never used. So when it, it's, a fail, it's a fair inference to say that it isn't random. Well, but it still, but it would still be the word was it'd be an inference. It wouldn't be a fact. Yet it's presented as a fact, and it is not a fact. It's as simple as that. It's not a fact. Those mutations that were on the board, although the the the, or, the description of the article was that chance mutations, everyone having by chance, the ones that are on the on the skull shape, there are no data that show that they were by chance. Maybe they were a chance, maybe they were a And in that line, there may have been a hundred other mutations that made heads look like that or like that, that, you, that never, that didn't make it. But still, it doesn't mean that, that they are by chance or random. It means that they haven't. So, it, it, so, I think for certain, some mutations are random. I think for certain that, because I think it's the way God runs the world. But I think also that there's, that there's a, a direction that's put into the system. We see that with the flood. I mean, in forgetting, the, in not even dealing with the fact that whether the flood happened or didn't, or could people live to nine hundred or couldn't, there's all answers for those types of things. But you have to realize that from Adam to Noah, there are ten generations. People are running, living along at nine hundred years of age, approximately, plus or minus a bit. It was a lousy idea. It was just a loser of an idea to have nine hundred year old people. And God says, point blank, chapter two, chapter six, verse seven, right before the flood, Nahamti, I regret having made the animal kingdom. So how do we get 900 year old people in this first place? One of the students, I think, said it perfectly, that we have this idea of Tsim Tsum, that God can pull back. God's always present. Biblically understanding God's always present, to let the system run, and then one of the students put it nicely, I thought it was correct, I think it's, a, it's good insight, that when you pass, when is this meandering, there's a threshold that God will allow in this meandering. And when the threshold gets too far out, God steps in and slaps the system around a bit. The flood would be a classic example. And God says, Nechamti. Three, three English minis for Nechamti, regret, reconsider, repent. The same thing happens with the first king of Israel. First king of Israel was? Who, who, you saw, who chooses Saul to be king? No. Shmuel anoints him. Who chooses Saul to be king? God chooses Saul to be king. God says, well, I want this man to be king. Saul messes up and God says, in chapter, it's, the, it's 1 Samuel chapter 15, God says the same word, Nahamti. I regret having chosen Saul king. So the biblical God can step back and allow the system to meander. And then steps in and puts it when it meanders too far beyond a threshold. If <coughs> you quote one of my students, at that, passing that threshold, then uh, shape up. And gets you gets you back online. We can see who knows what these disasters would be. But anyway, I want to get to you got to get to the ancient universe because I apologize. I mean, it's because the hour. Okay. Unfortunately, you can't download this. So I was going to tell you. Usually, the sessions I give, I tell people turn back on their cell phones and go to NASA, the NASA site, and then type in WMAP and and download and find your history in the universe. This is straight off the web, and you can you can find because in the previous session I just about. Two, three hours ago, the students actually downloaded it on their own, on, on their own iPhones and whatever they call those things over there. Anyway, what you can't see here, except for the general outline, is, well, first of all, this paper, this piece of paper is about eight or nine years old. The students' the sessions today, two hours ago, got the exact, it hasn't, same picture, hasn't changed one bit. The black is nothing, not a vacuum. The black of nothing doesn't fit in our brain. We can't, no human, thinks outside the box of time, space, and matter. Every human thinks in the same exact box, smart, dumb, or in between of time, space, and matter or energy. You can't, this is the box of the physical world. You can't think of the metaphysical. Try to imagine a universe with no time. You can't. Because every thought you have is couched in time, or space, or whatever. You can't, you can't conceive of an edge with an inside but no outside. There's this stuff that doesn't fit in our brain. And nothingness is something that doesn't fit in our brain. But this black is nothing. Not a vacuum, not an empty, a vacuum's empty space. That's in here. This is a timeline. The universe is expanding in all directions, hence the oval at the end. So I can't project it. 
there's 14 lines here, each for billion years. This is the creation. The universe expands out. And this line over here is where we are. And what science has accepted is the fact that, that the universe is created from absolute nothing. It develops over time. And eventually, this burst of energy, because that's all that we get out of this creation, burst of energy over here becomes so clever that it has people sleeping through lectures, feeling love and joy. How does a light beam work? What does a light beam have the hoods but to feel love? But that's what science accepts. This is the condensed knowledge of the scientific community of how you got from the Big Bang creation to today. And that's what we're going to get into, how these billions of years. But the first and most crucial part, I think is, I think is a YouTube line like that, because I did this, I, when someone asked me proof of God in five minutes, I think it's on sign I speak, but I'm not sure. I haven't seen it, but someone told me about it. Anyway, this is the creation of the universe. Look at the force that is told, so it won't be me saying it. From this point here, can you got anyone here read these these two words? With good eyes. Quantum fluctuations. Quantum fluctuations. Pretty good. And so I see I always say keep your phones and just turn them on to NASA. Quantum fluctuation. The scientific community accepts the creation of the universe from absolute nothing by a force. Let's call it forces of nature. Let's call it a force, okay? To make it simpler. A force couched with the forces of nature, which means within which the forces of nature count. There are many forces of nature. It's not just the quantum fluctuation, you need the laws of relativity also, but you need the laws. So a force creates the universe from absolute nothing. <coughs> for, for a force to create the universe from absolute nothing, does that mean the force has to predate the universe? It's not a trick question. Yeah, yeah, of course it does. It creates it from nothing. <laughs> so that means it predates our understanding of time. I mean, there may be other aspects of time that we don't understand, but these forces predate our understanding of time. So I have a force that predates time, or is outside of time, is not physical because it creates the physical, and creates the physical universe from absolute nothing. Doesn't that sound familiar? A force outside of time predates the universe, creates the universe from absolute nothing. What? Yeah. Say it. Someone said it. The Almighty Creator God. Yeah. Yeah, you can make a joke out of it. Make a joke out of it, but the simple fact is, scientists have said to me, atheist scientists, if you want to call that God, call it God. When I point out to them that it's the spot-on <coughs> definition of the biblical God. Outside of time, not physical, creates the universe from absolute nothing. Science has essentially discovered God. And the atheists, including like the Dawkins type people, say, yeah, if you want to call that God, call it God. But it would not, and here's where they put the caveat, the limit. But that God of the science would not be interested in the universe it created. It might be interested in creating the universe, but it wouldn't be actively interested in the universe. It wouldn't step in and you know direct the system from time to time. How did they know? So it'd be a deist so it'd be a deist God. It'd be a deist God. Science but a science admits to half the cup. It's a phenomenal step forward. You realize atheists accept the fact I say like the cup is half full. Atheists accept the fact that we have that the force that created the universe is essentially the biblical God description. They just have to call it the force of nature. Even if it's a force that God uses nature is consistent. I mean, when God splits the sea in front of the, of the escaping Israelites and the Egyptians are following, the text in, chapter, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, God used a strong east wind that blew all night. The sea is split by a strong east wind that blew all night. God needs to win like a whole day. God could have changed the world to marble. He would have rollerbladed across, and that would have been impressive. But instead, God works through nature because the world will have to look nature, natural because after the Israelites go through, who follows them right on in? The Egyptians. It's just a win. What's the big deal? Consistently, God uses nature when nature is available. If you create the laws of nature, you might as well use them. And the laws of nature allow the creation of the universe from absolute nothing. That's a given. Provided 
He got the laws of nature before the universe. So the only question that remains is, in this biblical God, is this God that creates the universe that science has essentially verified <coughs> interested in the universe it created? That's all. That's what you have to figure out from that point. Right? That's, the only, that's the only question that remains. And Moses, in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, says, if you want to figure out if God is really run on the show, Zechor yemot olam, binot shenot door for door. Zechor yemot olam, remember the days of old, and Chazal tell us the days of old are the phenomena that happen between the creation of the universe and the appearance and the creation of the soul of Adam. Is it likely that this could happen by chance, or is it likely there's some tweaking of the system, especially getting the system started, having rocks, having dirt become alive, which we have no data that support how that could happen. But if that does, so that's the Choya Motolam, the six days that flow from a burst of energy to, to intelligent life, feeling emotions, consciousness, awareness of itself. And then the second half, he says, is be no chinok door for door. Look at the flow of social history. He says, if, if the science doesn't wow you, what about this, the flow of social history? Does that, mean, does that show something? And everyone, even the atheists, they say, yeah, there are strange things that happen, but they wouldn't relate it to God. They do say strange. And the biggest strange thing that consistently comes up in these conversations is us. Us. The Jews. 3,300 years ago, just, God says, you will be my marker in this world, for better or for worse. For worse, just look at Madoff and how many hundreds of thousands of lives he ruled. Everyone knows he was a Jew, a lousy Jew. So it only it does it, it. We are chosen here to be markers. And if you think it's all for beauty and goodness, just read Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 26 and verse 27, and it'll set you straight on how, what our position in the world is. It's really worth reading it a few times a year. In any rate, okay. So is is this which is this which created this God this God force that created the universe active in the universe, or is it all random? Two sources of information: the flow from from energy to life. You know, some people say yes, some no. And then the the fact that 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 Jews, for some reason, that were predicted 3,300 years ago to be the markers, turn out to be the marker. Africa's burning alive, and the United Nations is only interested in Israel. You know, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Anyway, so much for that. That's the easy part. Now let's talk about, I to talk about what I was asked to talk about. Namely, the ancient universe. Uh, Timeline. Here we have. Today, <laughs> is this large enough to be seen in the back? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These be the Bible data. You know how we get that by adding up all the ages in the in the biblical text. It's interesting that the Bible gives ages because it didn't have to give ages. So why did Bible give ages? You know, if they didn't give ages, they have no idea of a six thousand year old universe or a billion year old universe. But for some reason, the the, uh, the text gives us ages because it helps actually understand the validity of the Bible. <coughs> so you add up all the ages in the, in the biblical text, then you get kings, queens, rulers, etc. get to today, and you get less than 6,000 years. Over here we have the creation, properly called the Big Bang. The term the Big Bang <coughs> does not tell you what made the Big Bang go bang. Understand that the term the Big Bang is only a secular way of saying creation. It was coined by Fred Hoyle, who later became an avid, avid, avid believer in the absolute necessity of a God dividing the world, otherwise we know no understanding of it. He was a, 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 a chemical physicist who dis dis discovered essentially how the elements are made in the stars. But he believed, as did most scientists less than 50 years ago, that the universe is eternal. Probably not many people in this room are aware of the fact. But less than 50 years ago, the overwhelming, overwhelming scientific opinion was creation of the universe. The Bible is wrong from the first sentence. The universe didn't have a beginning, it's eternal. You may not be aware of that, but that was the scientific, the Greek view of the world. In other words, there was no beginning, no creation. And then <clears throat> in the late 60s, early 70s, the missing data were discovered. Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson get the Nobel Prize for that. The, the echo of the Big Bang, as it were, 
but <coughs> that's only 50 years ago. Back in about 1950, this scientist Fred Hoyle, who felt the universe was eternal, as did most scientists, was on the on the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation radio, being interviewed, and the interviewer said, "Well, Professor Hoyle, there are a few of these scientists out there that think you're wrong. They think there actually was a creation of the universe." And Hoyle responded, "Yeah, they think there was some kind of a Big Bang. It was a coined term, coined totally in derision. Ah, oh, some kind of a Big Bang." But the press picked it up, and since that time. It's a very useful term to have because if you're a secular person and you want to talk about the creation, the last word you want to use is creation. God forbid it sounds like the creator. You know, you want that. That's about 14 billion years ago. So those are the science data. And the way that we that we that we see this. And to get this number, the universe starts with a burst of energy. The universe expands out. <coughs> and the, the nature, the beautiful nature of light coming from galaxies, or light coming from anything, is both a particle and a wave, which we have no idea what that means, but that's the way it turns out to be because there's no way of envisioning both a particle and a wave at the same time. But the wave aspect is very useful, because when a source of light is moving towards you, then each bit of light has to travel a bit less, and so each wave is squeezed together. And when you squeeze together light, it, turns, it moves towards the color blue. Each a particle moving away from you, whether it's a light ball or, ball or a galaxy, moving away from you, each bit of light travels a bit more, so it's stretched out, and a stretched wavelength is towards the red. It's called red shifting. All the galaxies look like they're red-shifted. Do you have to, to say something? Oh, uh, okay, cool. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. <coughs> okay, okay. Right. I got Terry right in, in evolution. <coughs> okay, so we look out, we see the universe expanding. We can measure the rate, thanks to Edward Hubble's work and the work of Henrietta Leavitt, and so she was about to get the Nobel Prize, but she determined how you can actually measure these rates that Hubble uses, but she died of cancer before she could get the Nobel Prize. We can measure how, how, rates, how fast the universe is expanding. Galaxy this year moves to the next year, moves to the next year, but instead of going to next year, what about last year? Millions of years ago, billions of years ago, when you run the equation back in time, it takes about 14, 15 years to get back to the point. So we have two calendars, 57, 75 years, 14 billion years. The calendar splits where? Day zero in this, in this calendar starts at what point? What's the event that marks the Rosh Hashanah, the New Year? What? Yeah. Okay, there's obviously that's the scale. It's pretty good. And there are a lot of nuances here. I'm not going to get into this. <laughs> yeah. Am I? No, no, no. Okay, now I'm holding. Can you hear me when I talk like this? Okay, 57, 75 years from Adam, the calendar splits here, and we have the six days leading up to Adam. And then we discover it's not even six days, it's five and a half days. Why? The Talmud says Adam is created halfway through the sixth day. We're not getting to Adam at the moment, but that, that creation is Adam's soul. My mother always talks about these Adam beings that didn't have a soul, that were the same as Adam, the Adam, same intelligence, same shape, but, but spiritually totally different. So, this is, Adam is not the first homo sapiens sapien, Adam's the first homo sapiens sapien with the neshama. Okay, so how old is the universe at for the now? Well, the universe is 57, 75 years plus five and a half days. Just a, we only have a few minutes left, so a quick show of hands. How many of you have ever heard, even if you don't believe it, how many of you have ever heard that the six days of Genesis weren't really six 24-hour days, they were long periods of time? Hey. Yeah, amazing, huh? Everyone. And yet all ancient commentary, with no exception, says the days are 24 hours each. Like the six days of a work week. And the only two sources that I've ever found that you talk about at all are Rashi in Hagiga, where he says, point with, it's the easiest Rashi in all Shas. He says, Yom Kaf Dalet Sha'od. What does that mean? Yom Kaf Dalet Sha'od. 
24 hours. You can't beat that one for simplicity. And the Ramban... Is a Sha'a an hour? Uh, exactly. So the Ramban, not being a dummy, realized... No, it's a perfect question. The, the Ramban realized that, that these types of questions come up. So the Ramban also says 24 hours, and then says... Kumoshesha Yame Avoda. Now answer the question. Like the six days of a work week. So there's no chance for the hours to be different. It's very interesting. The Rambach told me he had to lock that in. But he's in the Kuba, so he realized that there are people always asking good questions. Yeah. The days are 24 hours each, like the six days of a work week. So we're stuck with that. So how do we get billions of years out of that? That's the beauty of having the calendar and the ages. So just as we go through this, the, uh, the, the first point that we have to see is that there are two descriptions of time in the Torah. From Genesis 1 to Genesis 31, the end of the, in Gen in the first chapter, Erev and Boke Yom Chad, Erev and Boke Yom Sheni, Erev and Boke, in other words, evening, the translations are defective, but evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, a second, evening and morning, a third, etc. And then from Adam <coughs> forward, that's Genesis chapter 1, the calendar stops until you get to Genesis chapter 5. And then the calendar begins again, Adam and Eve they have 130 years, have a kid named Seth. That's because the first two kids are taken. <coughs> Gone. Adam and Eve live 130 years, have a kid named Seth. Seth lives 105 years, has a kid named Enoch. Enoch lives such. From Adam forward, every passage of time is human based, earth based. When Adam and Eve live 130 years, have a kid named Seth, they're not, li they're not living on Andromeda or on Mars. They're living, living on Earth. So the calendar from Adam forward is 100% earth based. There's no way of getting around that. But what are the first six days? It's just totally bizarre. Evening, morning, of first one day, evening, morning, of second day. So the answer to Ramban is brings extraordinarily interesting. He says, why does the form of the number change? Why does the form of the number change? The first day is said, evening and morning, Yom Echad. But the next day is Yom Sheni Shlishi. Why does it why doesn't it say Yom Rishon? And he gives the reason. And he writes something, if you say the only, the reason the text writes day one, Rashi has a different take on this, okay? We're talking about Tachlis here now. How the world is put together. He says the Torah could not write a first day on the first day, because the only time you write first is when it's relative to a second. We see that in the first and the second world war. During the first world war, people called the first world war the first world war? No, or the pessimists, but nobody else did. Everyone called the first world war the great war. Thank you. The great war, the war to end all wars. But by the Second World War, everyone called it the First World War. I fought the First Lebanese War. I can tell you, not one of us in Lebanon called it the First Lebanese War. It was the war in Lebanon. It was the Lebanese War. No one, not one of us called it the First Lebanese War. But by now we say, I fought in the First Lebanese War. And other people fought in the Second Lebanese War. So the change, so you see, even in, uh, sadly, it's a sad example. I don't even like to bring the example, but it, it brings it right down to home. That in fact, these things... Or we, that, the, that the Torah wrote day one because it wasn't a, wasn't a, a second day. That's, now that's bizarre because I, I'm, I'm convinced in my heart that Nachmanes actually read the Bible a few times. And he knew the Torah wasn't given back here. It's given out here in a mountain. What's the mountain called? <laughs> Sinai. How many years from Adam to Moses on Sinai? 1,000 years. Yeah, 2448. 2448, right. Years? times 365 days a year, it comes out to be approximately, I'm holding it, 900,000 <laughs> days. By the time you get, by the time you get, am I, is that what I'm doing? Oh no, you can't see it. <laughs> by the time you get to Adam, by the time you get to Moses on Sinai, <laughs> We've had almost 900,000 second days. If the view of Torah were from Sinai looking back, the Torah could have written evening and morning a first day, Nachmanides points out. But the Torah says day one, because the Torah sees time, it turns very rightly, from the beginning looking forward, from the only time there wasn't a second day. We look back and we see 14 billion years. But the Torah sees time from the beginning looking forward from a different perspective. It says, how old is the universe? Oh, about five and a half days old. It's 
with different perspectives. The years went by. There were cavemen, and there were dinosaurs, and there was the earth forming four billion or five billion years ago, and there was the solar system, etc., etc. Those billions of years went by. <coughs> but how would they be perceived? The operational word here is perceived. How would they be perceived from the beginning or before? From the creation of Adam, at this creation here, the Bible changes its perspective of time. From a, from a cosmic view, looking from the beginning looking forward, to an earth-based system. And that's why the calendar changes. From evening, morning, day one, evening, morning, second, day two, Adam and Eve live such and such years. They're living on earth. It's earth calendar here. What's the calendar back here? The cosmic view. And from when? From the only time in the history, time where there hadn't been a second day. That's on the first day. It's hard to imagine a time where there weren't other days because we live in a sea of days. It's just unending. But the fact is there was a time when there were no other days. And that is from the beginning looking forward. So why should that make a difference? For, and then this is one other no, nuance from what is the viewpoint. Now, Maimonides writes that time is created at the creation, which is a tremendous insight, the idea that time would have a creation. But then he makes it uh, to sharpen it. He says, but the clock of the Bible begins <coughs> when matter forms <coughs> from the energy. Mishia yesh it fospos man. The energy is described as dakma old ein bomamash. He couldn't write energy because en what's the word for energy? Energia. 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 Energia is the it's a totally borrowed word. <coughs> but energy, he writes matter forms. Nishi yesh gefos goes on ofet. Time grabs a hold, which happens to be true because energy is literally outside of time. Energy condenses into matter, as Einstein pointed out, and that is inside time. And that transition took about a hundred thousandth of a second. It's a minuscule amount of time, a hundred thousandth of a second. So the clock begins there. What, 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 what would that make a difference? Why did it interest a commentator over 800 years ago who says it's not his idea, a guy from his going, teachers going back, back to Sinai, from 3,000 years ago of seeing time from the beginning, looking forward. See, time, time is time. Where does it matter where you see time from? But it turns out that's not the case. Time is vast, actually, totally dependent on the perspective. A quick thought experiment. The galaxy over here, this galaxy is big and far away. And we're watching it over here with our great big telescope. That is some galaxies of beauty. But I don't see the galaxy lifetime. I see it after the light reaches me. Let's say it takes billions of years for the light to be so far away. I'm a galaxy of star explodes. Light goes out in all directions. Just talk about the light coming towards us. It's the same in all directions. A week later, another star explodes. Wow, two supernovae separated by one week. Of course, I don't see them now. It hasn't reached the light, it hasn't reached us. Boom, and a week later, a second. I won't know about them until the light reaches us. But as that light travels through space, what's space doing? That's the universe actually doubles in size. So back here, it's a week apart. But now the space is twice as big. The first person to tell us, go, wow, a supernova. How much later is the second? Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks, exactly. I see two weeks. That's my perception. The operational word here is perception. What would it be if the galaxy itself? I have to go back in time, mathematically. Well, the galaxy may not even exist in only so many billions of years. But I have to go and I quote an astronomer, how far away, etc., etc. And I go back in time. As I go back in time, the universe gets bigger or smaller. And the two weeks become one week. Two perceptions at one time. I look back in time, and the billions of years went by. How would they be perceived from here? For that, I have to know something pretty important. And the important thing I have to know is how much space had stretched. How much space had stretched from, from here to here. I don't know the size. No one knows the exact size of the universe. But we can calculate how much space has stretched. Because every time the universe doubles in size, the energy level is diluted by a factor of two of the temperatures by we're saying it. The temperature drops by a factor of two. We know the temperature of space today, it's three degrees above absolute zero. About minus 270 centigrade, about minus 450 Fahrenheit. It's almost at absolute zero. The temperature back here we know not by observation, but by measurement in laboratories. Because we know the mass of the first stable forms of matter, protons that, that make the elements protons, the proton, the center of the every F, of every atom. If you just said number one, you'd say hydrogen. You said number two, you'd say helium. You say number six, carbon. The number of protons that are present determine the, the nature of the uh, 
of the element. We know the energy it takes to make a proton. We know the energy level here. This number by the back number tells you how much space is stretched. And the stretching is 900 billion, which is interesting that it's all in billions. It could have been anything other. And it's a unitless number. The space has stretched by 900 billion. Unitless means the following. If I divide 10 degrees by 5 degrees, what's the answer? 10 degrees divided by 5 degrees equals? Equals what? Two? What happened to the degrees? Exactly, it's universe. The degrees cancel. So that given with temperature to temperature, they cancel, and the ratio, the stretching, of nine, is 900 billion, and has no, no units in it. 900 billion stretch, stretching. Which means if I had 900 billion seconds worth of hits on the caveman, how many seconds would it look like from here? Exactly. 900 billion days would look like one day. And just to cut to the chase, we have 14 billion years. Divided by 900 billion. So the nice thing is the billions all cancel out. And with 14 years divided by 900, which equals 15 thousandths of a year, the age of the universe, from the Bible's point of view, it's not even a year, it's 15,000 views, taking only Tony science numbers. If I had never heard five and a half days, whatever, whatever, six days of Genesis, never heard God from the book of Genesis, I could have said, well, if I had this view, and I wanted to go back to when the universe was just forming, <coughs> what, would the, these, what would these 14 billion years look like? There's not a bit of theology in this. 14 billion years divided by the science number, 900 billion, comes out to be 15,000 of a year. And to make that so we have to remember decimal points, I change it in the days, and you get five and a half days. And that's not a trick. <laughs> now you can make a joke out of it, my friends, but I'll tell you, you want to get that kind of joke yourself because that calculation for my book on the bestseller list for an entire year. And I'm not bragging, the royalties did it just right. <laughs>